Hello everyone, my name is Bernadette Knox and I am a project geologist with the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. Thank you for attending my virtual talk. Uh, today I will be presenting on the Volcanogenic Massive Sulfide Focused Mapping Initiative that I've been conducting in the Slave Craton of the Northwest Territories. If you have any questions about what I'm going to present today, my contact information will be available at the end of the presentation and please reach out if you do have any comments or questions. In this map of the Northwest Territories, the Slave Craton is represented in light pink and that's the portion that's um, within the Northwest Territories and where my work is focused. Today I'm going to present some of the more recent work that has taken place in the summers of 2019 and in a limited capacity in 2020. In general, the Northwest Territories Geological Survey works in collaboration with academic and industry partners to get additional work and expertise being focused on the geology of the Northwest Territories. This project is the same in that it has been done in collaboration with Drs. Michelle DeWolf and Camille Parton and their graduate students at the University of Saskatchewan. This simplified image of the Slave Craton shows some of its fundamental components. Oldest in purple is the basement complexes which contain the oldest known components of crust, including the Acasta gneiss, that range from 4.03 to 2.8 billion years old. Locally on this margin, and not represented in a color, is the approximately 2.85 billion year old central slave cover group that contains quartz aronite and banded iron formation, among other things. In greens are the greenstone belts. In the Yellowknife greenstone belt, these are the tholeitic basalts of the 2.73 to 2.70 billion year old CAM group and the Kalkalkinlin Banting group at 2.68 to 2.66 billion years old. And then they're known and interpreted equivalents across the craton. In gray is the turbidites of the Burwash formation and in light pink are syn volcanic plutons and post tectonic granitoid intrusions that are as young as 2.58 billion years old. We often discuss the slave craton geology with a Yellowknife greenstone belt point of view. As we test hypotheses and continue making comparisons around the craton, it's clear that there are some fundamental outstanding questions about the style and timing of amalgamation of the craton, and of particular interest to this talk, the tectonic setting of emplacement of volcanic rocks and the geodynamic processes that control metal endowment. This mapping initiative will increase the lithofacies and geochemical knowledge of greenstone belts through 1 to 20,000 scale mapping and complementary 1 to 5,000 and 1 to 2,000 scale mapping completed by graduate students. Work is being conducted in both areas of known VMS mineralization and in areas that are apparently under-endowed. The project is also picking up where exploration and research into VMS deposits left off in the late 80s and early 90s as the diamond rush began. In this talk, I'm going to highlight two different study areas and what we are learning about the nature of the geology and the VMS mineralization. I will start with a study of various aged volcanic rocks and the VMS style bedrock geochemical anomalies in the Winter Lake greenstone belt, which is in the center of this map on the screen. And then we'll move north to discuss the relatively well-known geology in the Point Lake greenstone belt, where I have started a mapping program that utilizes a new aeromagnetic survey. The Winter Lake greenstone belt is a large volume greenstone belt that's located approximately 250 kilometers north-northeast of Yellowknife. This area has preserved a relatively complete geological stratigraphy and in addition to the Cam and Banting group equivalent rocks, which are shown in green, there's also the older 3.3 to 3.1 billion year old Newbigging formation, which is represented in yellow. This project was designed to map in various different structural domains to best examine the relationship between the plutonic basement complex rocks 
and the supercrustal rocks, particularly the volcanic rocks. The work that I did was 1 to 20,000 scale mapping that was initiated in 2019. There's also been detailed mapping transects completed by students at the University of Saskatchewan. There are several known VMS style showings in this area, and we're going to take a look now in more detail. On this simplified geological map of the New Bigging Lake area, there are four VMS style showings which I've placed on this map and details of what we know about their geological context. From north to south, we have the HOK zinc lead copper showing, which is hosted in an amphibolite. The key drilled showing with a zinc anomaly in a volcanic argillite. The 152 showing, which is described as a zinc rich chert volcanic rock. And the WDZT001 showing, which is described as a copper rich tonalite. Having an area this size with such a diverse set of showings is really interesting. There doesn't seem to be a consistent story about the style of mineralization and so part of our aim is to place these showings more robustly within the volcanic stratigraphic context. Even though this is an amphiblade grade greenstone belt, there is certainly more detail about the mineral deposit style that we can gain from this area. You can probably also notice at the map scale evidence for late faulting. This makes the correlations across these panels somewhat more difficult and we've been greatly helped by our multi-scale mapping approach. So I'm now going to zoom in on work that was completed at the New Bigging Lake area and the 152 showing. On this preliminary map, approximately from east to west, we move from the Archean basement complex rocks that are very variably deformed and magmatized and also contain variable amounts of magnetic Yamba granite suite. In the center, there are yellows of the felsic volcanic units that were described by Harabi in 1999 as the 3.1 to 3.3 billion year old Newbigging formation. These felsic volcanic rocks were far less extensive than had been previously mapped, and it was also possible for us to break out diff different felsic lithofacies, such as competent rhyolite flows and felsic volcanoclastic units. In greens are the snare and credit formations, which are cam and banting group equivalents. The rocks are amphibolite grade, but we have been able to divide into aferic massive mafic intrusions, medium grained intrusions, and pillow and ma pillow basalt and massive basalt flows. We did see some rocks of the central slave cover group that were mainly represented by quartzites. And then not in the photographs are the units in gray, which are the burwash formation, metaturbidites, and in red are the meta conglomerates of the Jackson equivalent formation. In detail, we were able to split our main volcanic rocks and mafic rocks into multiple components. While doing field mapping, it was possible to distinguish volcanic and synvolcanic rocks from younger gabbroic intrusions, which are shown in these two photos. Geochemically, when plotted on an extended rare earth element spidergram. The mafic rocks in black are the volcanic and synvolcanic intrusions and in red we have the gabbros. The volcanic rock geochemistry has a much more pronounced negative niobium anomaly relative to thorium and lanthanum. This work goes a long way in explaining variations in endowment in the Winter Lake Greenstone Belt, simply that there aren't VMS showings in the plutonic rocks. This geochemistry and mapping will also provide a more robust exploration strategy that, at a minimum, will be possible to be applied to the southern Winter Lake Greenstone Belt. We will now look at detailed work that was completed at the 152 showing, located approximately 6 kilometers to the northeast. This 1 to 2,000 scale map was completed in 2020 in the area surrounding the 152 showing. 
It places the massive sulfide lenses parallel to the volcanic stratigraphy and appears to be part of this volcanic stratigraphy. The massive and pillow basalt flows young to the southeast and you can see on this map that the massive sulfide mineralization is elevated in calcopyrite and pyrite and locally pyrotite. These sulfide lenses sit adjacent to reactivated faults that we interpreted to be original syn volcanic faulting that strikes from the northwest to the southeast. For more information on this work, I encourage you to check out Dawson Stone's oral presentation as part of this online symposium. All right, so now we'll move into the Point Lake Greenstone Belt area. On the Nunavut side of the border, we have the Isaac, Hood, and Gondor VMS deposits, as well as the past producing Lupin Gold Mine. These rocks are hosted in seemingly contiguous geology that extends into the Northwest Territories. The Point Lake area has a really complete preservation of the geological record. The exposure and access along the lake is also superb and it is a place where we can ask and test many questions. On the NWT portion of these greenstone belts, do we really have rocks that are under endowed in BMS mineralization? And if so, what are the differences with rocks to the north? This project also benefits from having a relatively well understood geology, and I've included some past references here. It's a big diversity of work that's already happened from drift prospecting to structural and geochronological studies, and even some regional bedrock mapping. So far, our work has been focused in Cascara Bay which is outlined in the red oval, and then this past summer to the west in the arrowhead outlier. This image is a geophysical interpretation of a high resolution fixed wing aeromagnetic survey in the Itchen and Point Lake areas. The project was funded by the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency and was released as an NTGS open report 2019-003. The geophysical interpretation, along with 3D inversions of this data, will be published in the near future. I'm now going to zoom in on the Arrowhead Outlier, which is where my 2020 fieldwork was focused. On this image, I'm showing a stacked magnetic susceptibility voxel. At the bottom are isosurfaces of different susceptibility levels. There's then a 2D plane of residual magnetic data, and the geology is draped over the topographic surface. In 2020, I was able to begin reconnaissance mapping in this volcanic belt outlier, and I'll show you some details from that work now. This geology is taken from Easton 1980. We are using this along with our new field observations and the 3D magnetic data to observe and interpret the geology in this area in a new way. We're actually able to look at the cratonic architecture in this region. The mafic volcanic rocks are polydeformed and folded into an arrowhead fold interference pattern that has turbidites in the core. The boundaries along the greenstone belt are variably deformed. Some places so show simple strain contacts up to zones of 100 meter wide, heavily deformed volcanics. The top two photos are the appearance of the basement complex, which includes variations in the level of strain as well as compositional variations. The two central photos are of mafic volcanic rocks. One is relatively undeformed and another with an injected leucosome and that has been heavily folded. And at the bottom is a sulfide rich garnet bearing turbidite. The turbidites in this area show metamorphic isograds that 
across from the cordierite to the garnet PT fields. This metamorphism and the absolute timing of thermal events is part of a graduate project that has been postponed until 2021. In conclusion, our work is to continue to understand the slave craton early history through studying environments of emplacement of volcanic rocks and their related sedimentary rocks. We're placing VMS style showings within volcanic stratigraphy and demonstrating that it's possible to use chemostratigraphy to target areas of increased prospectivity for VMS mineralization. Replacing VMS style showings in a litho and chemostratigraphic context within the volcanic sequences, and we're using 3D geophysical data in ways that's not been previously possible to study the craton architecture. The work that we're doing is spanning multiple greenstone belts, different land dispositions and land claim areas, and using all of this knowledge to increase vectors towards VMS mineralization craton wide. To finish up this talk, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of people who have been influential in the completion of this work. Particularly, I would like to thank Beth Fisher, who's with the NTGS, and Melissa Clark, who is one of our summer students, for all of their excellent assistance in the field this summer. Thanks also to the different organizations at the bottom of the slide for the funding that has made this work possible. Thank you so much for your attention today, and I do hope that you'll reach out to me and my colleagues if you have any questions about the work that you've heard about today. I encourage you to also check out more of this year's submissions within the Virtual Geoscience Symposium, and I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks very much.